I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflection on Georgia Politics, another in a series of oral histories sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're in Nashville, Georgia today in the home of Dawson Mathis, former congressman from Georgia's 2nd District who served five terms in Washington. Welcome, Congressman Mathis. Thank you for sharing some of your memories of your political career uh, with us on our series. You were born here in Nashville. Tell us a little bit about your early life, your family, and growing up here in Nashville. Well, I don't <clears throat> know that there's very much of, that would be of interest, Bob, but I did grow up in Nashville in Barron County. I was born here in uh, November of 1940. My family, both on both my mother and father's side were natives of Berrien County and had been in this county for generations. So it was kind of a, a small town growing up experience, but uh, one that I treasure. My, my father, when I was like six years old, managed to borrow enough money to open a little grocery store and he and my mother ran that store uh, from 1947, I guess, until 1964, when the Internal Revenue Service came in and put a padlock on his door. And, but most of my afternoons were, and a lot of times early mornings were spent in that in that grocery store. Uh, so I do something about hard work and discipline. And back in those days, on Saturdays in particular. Uh, we wouldn't get out of that grocery store until 11 or sometimes 12 o'clock at night. And particularly during the, 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 the tobacco season, as we call it, when they were selling tobacco, uh, it, it would be particularly chaotic. And as long as, as there was potential for a customer to come in, my father wanted to keep those doors open because it, even in the, in the 1940s and 50s, things were still pretty tough down here. Uh, but. I guess looking back on it, I had a fairly typical small town kid's life. I enjoyed uh, school, I enjoyed sports, I en enjoyed my friends. I made a lot of lifelong friends that uh, we still uh, have contact with and, and it's, it's, uh, it was a, a wonderful experience. I wouldn't have traded it for growing up anywhere else. My, uh, High school classmates were foolish enough to elect me class president of the graduating class in 1958, and um, I did not know at the time that it was a lifetime job, but they still call on me today when we're getting ready to do a class reunion or something like that. I'm, I'm the first one to, to, to be in the, in the van. So then you went away to uh, South Georgia College. Yeah, another good experience. I, I did not uh, complete my course of education in South Georgia. I was interrupted by a marriage and a child, foolishly, but <laughs> happily. Uh, but I started there in the fall of 1958 and uh, completed two quarters and then uh, dropped out, got married, and went back into the fall of 59 and completed one more quarter and then my wife became pregnant with our first child and I had to seek full-time employment rather than continuing to unload boxcars for the Alfred Dorman Grocery Company in Douglas. So, and I then left, uh, when we left, I, I was able to secure a job with Flowers Baking Company uh, running a bread route in Valdosta, which was a unique experience, uh, but also a good one. I made a lot of friends in Lowndes County, Valdosta and Lowndes County, and, and uh, learned a lot about real life when you get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning to unload boxcars and run bread route. Uh, life is a reality. Then you went into television. Well, actually, I didn't go directly to tel from, the, from the bread truck to television, Bob. It was a little more circuitous route than, than that. I, I was actually doing some, uh, I started doing some part-time radio work for a fellow named Hanson Carter, who later served in the legislature and headed the, the uh, Farm Services Administration during the Clinton administration. But Hanson had a radio station here in Nashville and, and uh, I started doing some part-time work for him which led me to accept uh, 
a full-time radio job at a station called WRPB in Warner Robins, Georgia, which is where my wife was from. So we went, uh, moved to Warner Robins, and I worked at that station, and then came back to following a disagreement with the station's owner about the 1962 gubernatorial race, where I wanted to support Marvin Griffin, and he was supporting Carl Sanders. Uh, we decided that we would it would be to our mutual interest to part company, so... I came back to Nashville and worked with Hanson for a very short period of time, like six months or so, and then I moved to Hawkinsville and went to work for WCEH Radio where, with a fellow named Jim Popwell, who was a great influence on my life. Met a lot of people in Hawkinsville, enjoyed my time there, and then from there, through a fellow I had worked with at, at, at Water Robbins who had gone to WALB, uh, uh, TV in, in Albany, he called me and told me there was a job opening at WALB for the news director. Well, at that time I was 24 years old and I didn't know that I was qualified to be the news director for a television station, but I went down and interviewed and and, uh, and got the job. I actually took a little pay cut. I was making $100 a week in Hawkinsville and they offered me 85 a week to come to Albany to the television station, but I thought that at that time television had more of a, a potential than radio did, so I, I, I took the job and that led to a lot of other interesting things in my career when I went to, went to Albany. Uh, Albany at one time uh, was uh, the focus of a lot of national attention in the civil rights movement. Were you involved in any of that? Well, not really. It, that, that occurred primarily, Bob, before I got to Albany. That was 62 and 63, and I didn't get to Albany until 64, either August or September, I think it was August of 64 when I went to Albany. Um, but the, 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 the King arrest and the Albany, the Albany movement was still there. There was uh, primarily led by a, 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 an attorney named C.B. King, uh, who was a lawyer there in Albany, and, and a very articulate uh, man, and a very knowledgeable man, and a man I came to, to admire and like. I'm not sure he ever really liked me, but I liked <laughs> C.B. He had a, a very dry sense of humor, and, uh, and I'm getting off the subject, but that that the movement was still going on, but it was that past its heyday. The king had been arrested, and he had been he was gone from there. And there were some in the even in the black community and all, but it felt like King came in and used them uh, to raise money and focus attention on himself, and then that he had gone on to other things when the Albany movement was met by. Uh, I guess they they would it, it was passive resistance. It wasn't water hoses, it wasn't, uh, you know, billy clubs in the streets or whatever, it was just uh, Laurie Pritchett who was chief of police and all, but it just happened, remember, prior to the time I got there, but he and Asa Kelly was the mayor of Albany at the time, uh, who later served as the head of the Department of Corrections under a governor that you served, and then became a Superior Court judge in Albany. Asa Kelly and Laura Pritchett decided they were going to defuse the situation as best they could. Now, this knowledge comes to me after the fact. I wasn't there when it was going on, but obviously they were successful with what they did. But during the period of time I was in Albany, there were uh, continuing protests and demonstrations going on in some communities surrounding Albany, uh, Americas, um, Cordell, Moultrie. Cordial is where <clears throat> I first saw an American flag burned on front of the courthouse in, in Cordial. I was there with a camera, <clears throat> excuse me, with a camera, and we recorded that or filmed it at that time. We were using 16 millimeter film at the television station, but the, a group of, uh, of protesters, black protesters, took down a flag and burned it, and that's the first time that I sold a piece of film to a national network. NBC wanted that film because there was nobody else there. And in those days, burning the American flag was just unheard of. Mm -hmm. But but I was there for Cordial. I was there for uh, for Moultrie. There was there were problems in Moultrie in the in the late '60s, and uh, those were interesting days to say the least. 
At what point did you decide to run for Congress? Well, I don't know that I can actually uh, say for certain that uh, there was a particular day. I guess it probably was when my predecessor announced that he was not going to run again. Mastin O'Neill was, um, he, 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 I don't know where you ever saw a picture of whether you ever knew Mastin, but if you saw a picture of Mastin O'Neill, you'd say that guy's a congressman. He had a full head of silver hair, always wore a dark suit, a beautiful white shirt, and a polka dotted tie. You never saw him but anything other than that polka dotted tie. But Mastin was the kind of guy that he took everything too seriously. Um, he had three heart attacks in the six years he served in D.C. because he was so, my judgment is that he was so stressed out about making the right decision on every vote or every action that he took. And he didn't stay up. The, he, he was elected in 64 and served three terms at, at, at the in April of 1970, in his sixth year, he announced that he would not be running again. And after he left Congress, he lived probably for another 25 years. So the stress, relieving himself of that stress, obviously prolonged his life. But he was a, an interesting fellow, very conservative. Once told me that, uh, that there were two O'Neills in Congress. And if he needed to know how he was going to vote on any issue, he would just look and see how the other O'Neill voted, and he would vote the opposite <laughs> way. So I think it's safe to say that Maston was a pretty conservative fellow. Of course, at, uh, at, at, at that time, and I'm wandering off the point, but at that time, most of the Democratic members of Congress from Georgia and from the South generally were pretty conservative in their politics. But I'm... I had kind of laid the groundwork for for a run for Congress over the the three or four years prior to the time that uh, Congressman O'Neill announced he wasn't running again. I began to speak around to some civic clubs and make appearances here, there, and everywhere. And and of course, my my greatest asset in that race was the the, the name identification that I had from being on television because when I went there it wasn't just that I was the news director I was I was the news man I was the anchor on I, I did it at 725 in the morning 825 in the morning at 12 noon at 6 o'clock at night at 11 o'clock at night not generally all in the same day although that had happened on occasion but over a period of those uh, five and a half years that I was there I was I was in the living rooms of people in the district more than any other candidate possibly could have been. I mean, my, my exposure from that television was worth millions of dollars. You, I, you couldn't have bought that kind of publicity. Uh, when, I, when I would go into uh, anywhere, almost anywhere in the district, walk down the street, people knew who I was. And you, you just, I mean, that was tremendous asset in that race, which as it eventually turned out, Bob, it was not about a lot of issues. We, you couldn't have probably driven a wedge between us on very many issues with Harry Wingett Jr. and Fred Hand Jr. and myself. There was a black candidate in the race named Tom Chapman, and he might have differed with us on some issues, but by and large, we were pretty much the same on issues, so it turned out to be a beauty contest, and I won the beauty contest <laughs> is <laughs> essentially what happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, I, I made the decision that I was going to run when Congressman Notre Deal announced he was, and I knew it was my time. I was 29 years old, had four little children, and less than $500 in the bank, but uh, I just felt like it was it was time for me to run. So I went down to the to the office of the general manager of the television station, who was a friend of mine until the day he died, a guy named Ray Carrow. And I told Ray what I wanted to do and asked for a leave of absence. And he said, yeah, yeah that'll be fine. Well, Jimmy Gray, uh, James, a., James Harrison Gray, publisher of the Albany Herald, also at that time owned the television station, almost entirety in its entirety, I should say. So I felt like that I owed Mr. Gray the courtesy of going to him and telling him what I intended to do. So I got in my car and drove down to the Albany Herald and asked to see Mr. Gray and was shown in. And he and I were 
not very close. I mean, we knew each other very casually, but he didn't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day management of the television station. But I told him what I was going to, what I planned to do, and he obviously made it known to me that he was committed to Harry Wingate who had run against Maston and lost by 500 votes in a runoff in 64, which was only six years before that. And I told him I understood that. I just asked him to be fair to me in the, in the Herald and his news coverage, and he assured me that he would, which didn't turn out to be quite <laughs> the case. <clears throat> but when I got back to the television station, I had a note on my typewriter in the newsroom that said, Ray Caro needs to see you. So I went down there to see Ray, and, and he said, Dawson, I got to tell you that I can't give you that leave of absence. So I said, well, let me go type you up a letter of resignation, <laughs> Mr. Carroll, because I'm going to run. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Jim Gray had called him before I got back to the station and said, you can't. I told Jim Gray that Ray had agreed to give me a leave of absence from the station. But later on, <clears throat> during the race, I had a couple of people come to me and said I could have my job back at the station if I would drop out of the drop out of the race. But uh, I think I made it pretty clear to them that if I ended up shining shoes, I was going to stay in that race. I thought it was very winnable. And as it turned out, it, it was. Uh, in those days and today, there's quite a, a black uh, voter population in that district. How did you go about campaigning among? Uh, well, I campaigned among them just like I did with, with everybody else. I mean, it, <laughs> uh, I always had the philosophy that it doesn't make any difference who or why they put them in the box with your name on it. I just want them in the box. But in 1970, it's, it's kind of hard to believe as we look back from it from the perspective of where we are in 2008. But it, it was a different world out, particularly down here in South Georgia. and. There was one of the candidates in the race, which will remain nameless, who wouldn't shake hands with a black man. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and that word got to me. I had a couple, couple of guys tell me of having seen it, where he refused to to shake hands. He, in a white country store, he'd go and speak to the white people, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't shake hands or ask the black people for their vote. Well, I had had some experience, obviously, through my years in television, I'd made some inroads in the black community in my coverage of the civil rights movement, and I think I had gained the trust of at least a part of the black population by the way that I reported uh, on what was what was happening in their community, and and I th I know that that was beneficial to me during that during that race. I might also said that say that it it helped me that I had established relationships with a lot of law enforcement people and a lot of local officials, mayors and county commissioners and whatever. Um, a, a lot of these people felt that the national media, uh, NBC, CBS, ABC was less a presence in those days, I guess, but that were not reporting what was going on accurately. Now, whether or not that was true, I mean, I'll let others be the judge of that, but they felt like it wasn't, and they felt like that, that our coverage at Channel 10 was actually more accurate than what was being reported by the national media, and that gained me some confidence in the, in the, in the, in the local community. I, I think I can safely say that of the 23 counties in this district when I ran in 1970, I had the support of most of the sheriffs, mm -hmm. and, and that was a big help. Mm -hmm. And you finished uh, first in the primary and then had a runoff. And uh, then you had the great pleasure of uh, facing a Republican in the general election. <laughs> yeah, it was more of a pleasure in those days than it would be now, Bob, <laughs> because in those days Republicans were not very numerous in South Georgia. But yeah, the people in, this, in that district gave me uh, like 40, 48 and change percent of the vote in the first runoff. So, I mean, in the first primary, so we met, narrowly missed winning it without a runoff. Um, but then I was in a runoff with Harry Wingate, whose father had been the president of the Georgia Farm Bureau Federation, and he had been um, on Senator Russell's staff in D.C. for 
several years that had made and had made a run for Congress in 1964 and came within 500 votes of of beating Maston O'Neill for that open seat. So he was the prohibitive favorite, and I think most people thought he was he was going to be the winner. And uh, and Harry Harry was he was an interesting fellow. After that race in '64, he came. He stayed in Albany. He'd gone back to Washington. He ran for Congress actually the first time in 1954 when uh, Gene Cox died. There was a special election that J.L. Pilcher won it, and Harry ran then, and he was like about the same age I was when I was elected. He was 28, 29 years old, but he had been in D.C. and came back down to Georgia, ran in that race, and then when he wasn't successful, he went back to Washington, and Senator Russell put him on the staff of the Appropriations Committee, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and he served Senator Russell in that capacity until the 64 race when Mr. Pilcher announced he wasn't going to run again. And then Harry came back to Albany and uh, got in that race and, as I say, lost by about 500 votes to Master and O'Neill. Well, after that race, he stayed in Albany and began a, a, a practice of law over there and and uh, was in the you know, Rotary Club and got active in civic affairs over there, attempting to establish himself as somebody who was from the district as opposed to being uh, coming down from D.C. to run. Uh, I, on the other hand, was a newcomer. I, Barron County, my county, was not in that district at that, at that time, and, and so I was uh, an outsider. I was the, the intruder, but that didn't, uh, that did, that didn't work because it, the, the, the runoff turned out to be a, a pretty uh, bitter affair on his part. I, uh, he he went after me tooth and nail, and 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 I understand I understood it at the time. I understand it today. It was his only chance. This was his third run for Congress, and if he was going to be elected, it had to be now. And and uh, <laughs> we had a, a televised debate on Channel Ten, and they had a they still have a a, a, a noontime show over there called Town and Country, and they invited both of us to come and participate in a mini debate as it were and of course we agreed and and uh, Harry called me uh, he said you know we almost elected a boy to send him to Congress and you know he's not a member of a church which I was not at, at that time even though my father was a holiness Baptist preacher and and most people who knew me personally knew that fact that I wasn't a member of any civic club and blah, 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 which wasn't quite accurate, but nonetheless, he went after me tooth and nail on that program. And when, when that program was over, the phone, every phone line at WALB was lit up. I sat at the front desk for about 30 minutes until they finally really told me that the receptionist had to have her desk back. So they moved me to an open office, and I literally sat there from one o'clock until five o'clock, taking call after call after call of people calling in to tell me how treacherous they thought Harry had been and how nasty he was. And I knew then that the election was over. But what, <clears throat> what I also knew, I had a call, and I don't feel like I'm betraying a trust, but there was a, a the Ford dealership at Albany was a guy by the name of Bunny Pritchett. And Bunny uh, was and is one of the finest people I've ever known. Very active in the community, very uh, community spirited, and he did a lot for Albany. And everybody loved Bunny. He'd served as on the city council over there, just a good guy. And he and Harry were close friends. And he was in Harry's brain trust when Harry had run for Congress in 64 and when he was in this race against me. Uh, but I was in my headquarters that morning, I don't know what, I was just there doing something, and the phone rang and it was Bunny Pritchett. And Bunny said, Dawson, I want to tell you something. He said, I just can't be a part of what is about to happen. He's coming after you tooth and nail on issues that I don't agree that ought to be brought up in this race, but I just want you to be aware of what he's going to come after you. My wife worked for a contractor over there named John Gay, who was a friend of mine, and John had actually loaned me a little money, and maybe maybe a thousand dollars, 
And he said, and, but John had a liquor store, so I became the candidate of the biggest liquor dealer in, in Albany on that program, and, and Bunny told me that he was coming after me for my wife's employer who owned that liquor store. So it wasn't as if I weren't a little bit prepared for what he was coming with, thanks to Bunny Pritchett, but Harry destroyed himself that day on that debate. He, the race would have been a lot closer had he approached it in a different way, in, in my judgment. Harry's dead and gone, and, and uh, sent flowers to his funeral, but I never heard anything back from his family. Mm -hmm. I guess they presented what I had done, even though I never attacked Harry, and I never attacked any opponent I ever had. I just couldn't run a race like that. Even when I ran against Senator Talmadge in 1980, I never attacked him. I attacked his record, but I, didn't, I wouldn't attack him personally. And, and again, I'm digressing. I'm no, a rabbit's ball. No, sorry. that's wonderful. It's, uh, this is history, and we're interested in history. But we didn't mention your, your Republican opponent. <laughs> well, he was, he was a very nice young fertilizer salesman named Tom Ragsdale. A good looking guy, dark head of hair, and, uh, and, and fairly articulate. But uh, he, he was in the race, and then. After I won the primary, he announced he was not he was going to withdraw, and then a couple of weeks later, I don't know, somebody talked him into saying, well, he his name was on the ballot, so that he was still going to be a candidate, so he got back in, but he didn't do much campaigning, and he didn't he was probably about as underfinanced as I was. He didn't have any money, so uh, we were fortunate enough in the general election to end up with 93 percent of the vote, and. I guess that's probably pretty much unprecedented in Georgia history, and I don't think there'll be a, a congressional race in this state in mm -hmm. the next 50 years where a Democrat will get 93 <laughs> percent of the vote. It just ain't going to happen anymore. But my uh, the the biggest problem I had in that race, Bob, was, was money. Uh, as I say, I didn't have any money. My wife was working. I had four little boys, and I had no source of income. I mean, I was I was out of work and didn't. And I, when I was at the television station, when I left there, I was making $1,000 a, a, a month, $12,000 a year. And uh, raising the money was, was the problem, and I just I, I had no source for it. It was $25 here and $50 there and a fish fry here and a barbecue there and just catch as catch can. I, I remember one instance where I had, a, I had bought a, a a 30-minute television program, if you can believe it in, in this day and time, for <clears throat> and we had the, the, the taping schedule for this certain night, and, and the, the, the cost of a 30-minute program was $500. Well, I didn't have $500, but I was campaigning in, in, in Early County that day in Blakely, Georgia, and I had made the acquaintance of a, a businessman over there. He owned a large part of a bank, if not the whole bank, had a peanut company and was a very prosperous and very respected pillar of his community. The man's name was Guy Maddox. And I had met Mr. Guy on previous occasions. I had spoken to the Rotary Club in, in Blakely and he was a member. And on that particular day that I was due to schedule, I'm scheduled to, to take the program at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night at WALB, I didn't have $500 in the bank. So I went by to see Mr. Guy since I was in Blakely and asked him for his support. He said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for you, Dawson. And then he said, uh, you need any money? <laughs> Do I need any money? Does a farmer need rain? Uh, yeah, I need money, Mr. Guy. I said, yes, sir, I would appreciate anything you could do for me. And I'll never forget, he pulled up in his center desk drawer and took out one of those big checkbooks that you know have three checks in it. And he wrote me a check for five hundred dollars. <laughs> you never forget that. I came uh, <clears throat> straight back to the TV station, endorsed the check, handed it over to him, and we taped the program. <laughs> Excuse me. So then it's off to Washington. Freshman yep. congressman, what, 435 members? You must have felt like a needle in a haystack up there. 
Well, I didn't feel out of place. I felt like that's where I was supposed to be. <clears throat> I had, uh, I never had any political experience, Bob. You'll have to excuse me. I get, I buried an uncle yesterday, and I'm still a little emotional. Uh, I had, as you know, covered the legislature for the television station for years, so I knew a little bit about how the legislative process worked, uh, and I, I, I thought I was fairly astute politically. So, even though I was the youngest member of Congress, uh, I felt like I kind of fit right in. I was 29 when I was elected, 30 when I actually when I was sworn in, and I, I didn't keep that title very long. There was um, uh, uh, one of the long-serving and most distinguished members of Congress was from South Carolina, a fellow by the name of Mendel Rivers. Um, and Mendel Rivers died on Christmas Day of 1970, and a special election was held in April. And his successor was a friend, a, a guy who became my closest friend in Congress, named Mendel Davis. And Mendel was, uh, he was 28 when he was elected, so he took that title away from me in April. I, I held it from January to April in the way. But no, I didn't feel lost. I felt like I was capable of doing the job. If I guess you. If you're going to be in politics, you got to have a certain amount of confidence in yourself, or you wouldn't be there in the first place. But I never felt lost. I I, I felt like that was where I was supposed to be. Uh, we went up there. I again, I still hadn't had a paycheck <laughs> since April, and uh, my wife worked right on through uh, November, I guess, maybe even December. John Gay may have paid her for December, but. I now am faced with the task of getting my family to D.C. We've got to find a place to live, this, that, and the other. Um, so I made a couple of trips up there. We did find a, a house where, in a community where I thought that the kids could, out in Virginia, where they had a good school system and the, the kids would be comfortable. So we moved in uh, late December of, of 1970, and I had no other way to get up there, so I rented a U-Haul truck. And, we loaded her up and and headed out to D.C. And that's the first time I made national news when <laughs> they reported this young idiot from <laughs> who got elected to Congress in South Georgia moves his family to D.C. in a U-Haul truck. <laughs> well, <laughs> I tell you something else, Bob. I stayed up there until 2005 uh, for various reasons. Not all that time, not in Congress, obviously. But when I came back to this cabin where you're sitting, I came back in a U-Haul truck. So we went up there and came back in a U-Haul truck. <clears throat> but uh, I digress, as usual. But no, I, I felt very comfortable being in Washington. We, actually, the, the, the term of office begins on January 3rd. The previous Congress, the 91st, did not adjourn until literally New Year's Eve in 1970, so when they adjourned, they adjourned with a resolution to come back on the 21st of, of January of 1971. Uh, even though I was, I assumed office on January 3rd, I wasn't sworn, didn't take the oath of office till the 21st, which as you know, was the day that Senator Russell died. Mm -hmm. And I took the oath of office at noon and he died sometime after three o'clock in the afternoon, if, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So it's, it's one of the great pleasures of my life in saying that I served with Dick Russell. Mm -hmm. And I met him, of course, uh, on more than one occasion. I went to see him after my primary victory. I went to see him and called on him and Senator Talmadge when I had gone to Washington. But I'd, I never saw him after I was actually elected in November. I only saw him after I'd won the primary. But uh, so, yeah, we we, you know, just jumped right into it and started getting setting up the office up there. One of the best decisions I ever made was to to uh, uh, to keep the staff of, of uh, largely the, of my predecessor, Congressman O'Neill, since I had not challenged him. Uh, you know, there was no animosity there. He was extremely helpful to me. He had a, a chief of staff, executive assistant, administrative assistant, whatever you want to call it, by the name of John Ellis. John had been in D.C. for years and years and years and had worked for uh, Congressman O'Neill for the whole time he was there, so I asked John to stay on and to retain whatever staff he felt like would best 
serve the needs of my district. And John said, Congressman, you know, I'm eligible to retire. And I said, uh, yeah, I know that, John, but, you know, I, I need you. I, 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 I need help. And he said, well, I'll give you a year. And he did. And that was the best, uh, best decision that I made uh, as far as staff in my office was concerned was to, to, to keep John on. And, there, and we had some people had, I had a young man from Brinson, Georgia, who was working as press secretary for Congressman O'Neill by the name of George Watts. And George agreed to stay on. And, and we had, uh, I, I guess there were three other secretarial types, and administrative types that had worked with Congressman O'Neill or stayed on uh, with me which uh, they were a tremendous help. How did you meld with the party leadership? You had an orientation session? Yeah, we, we did, and, and it, was, it was helpful. Actually, it was a bipartisan. That, in those days, the orientation session, session was more bipartisan than I think it is today. I, I haven't had any recent experience with it, but Bo Udall, who was a congressman from Arizona, was one of the... Uh, one of the the people that did the orientation, and I was very impressed with Mo and and with what he did. But as far as leadership is concerned, see, it was there was a, a a majority leaders race going on, and Mo Udall was in that race. It was him and Hale Boggs and two of the others. I forget who all it was, but as this was John McCormick was leaving the speakership, and that had opened up and. It was clear that the then majority leader Carl Albert was going to become speaker, and he did. So the race was for majority leader, and it was uh, a pretty hotly contested race. Um, and I, my first exposure to leadership, well, after on election night, I got telegrams from all these people, congratulations, you know, blah 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 blah. But my first experience with the leadership was when I was sitting in my office. And one of the secretaries came in and said, "Hey, Boggs, uh, Congressman Boggs is on the phone." And uh, so I, of course, answered the phone. And he said, "I it was." He, he said, uh, "Dawson, this is Hale Boggs. I need to see you." And I said, "Yes, sir. I'll come right over." He said, "No, no, no. I'll come to you." And I said, "Mr. Boggs, that ain't the way I work." He said, "Sit tight. Can I come over?" And I said, "Yes." Yeah. So he came over and asked for my support. Well, I had already. And made up my mind that I was going to vote for Mo Udall on the first uh, go round, and Mo and his personal politics was a lot more, uh, I guess the word would be liberal, progressive, whatever than than, than I was. And but I felt like that, that that the institution in some ways needed to be shaken every once in a while, and Mo was was shaking, he was shaking the tree, and. Because it ended up in a in a in a runoff, but the, but the final two candidates were Hale and and Mo Udall, and Hale Boggs won. Of course, he later died in the in the uh, plane crash in, in Alaska with my friend Nick Baggage. But Mo Udall, in <laughs> in his concession speech in the caucus, made one of the most memorable statements I ever heard in all my time in politics when he. Uh, he he knew he both of them had counted votes and Mo knew he had enough votes to win. Of course he didn't, but he thought he did. And he said, "My friends, during this race, I have discovered the difference between a caucus and a cactus. On a cactus, all the pricks are on the outside." <laughs> and I have never forgotten <laughs> Mo's uh, concession speech. <laughs> you know they they say that uh, that new congressman tend to gravitate toward uh, people of their own professions, like lawyers to lawyers and, uh, and businessmen to businessmen. I doubt that there were any television celebrities in Congress at the time. Well, actually, so, there was one. There was uh, Lionel Van Duren from San Diego, California, had done a commentary on television. He wasn't a real reporter, but he had done commentary on a TV program out there and had gained some exposure. It's interesting you asked that question, Bob. The Washington Post did a story following my election that tracked, I believe there were 12 uh, races around the country, either at a congressional level or a gubernatorial level, where 
<clears throat> television so-called personalities were involved in these races. And of the 12 candidates, there was only one that, that won. And I was happy that that one was me. But that, that has changed. You know, Jesse Helms went to the Senate based on a television mm -hmm. career in North Carolina. And, and there have been others since that time. There also have been a number of professional athletes that, uh, that have gotten elected, uh, Jack Kemp. And of course, when I, I went to Congress, I served on the Agriculture Committee with a fellow by the name of Vinegar Ben Mizell. Wilma Mazell had been a baseball pitcher and had gained a lot of notoriety. And I also served with Bob Mathias, who was an Olympic champion mm -hmm. in, the, in the 50s and 60s from California. And so a lot of those guys had gained notoriety by uh, their athletic accomplishments. Mm -hmm. But there weren't a lot of people from my profession. But, you know, there have always been a lot of newspaper men involved in politics, uh, not the least of which was Harding, who owned newspapers in Ohio before he became president. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not a fifth the press is, or the media has never been involved in politics. It's, it's just a new world. And one point, let me back up just a bit. You were talking about my, my race for Congress. You must remember that in 1970, we didn't have satellites, we didn't have cable, we didn't have all these, didn't have computers, of course, you didn't have all these media outlets. when. People watched television in my congressional district. There were two stations that they had an option for, for the largest part of the district. They either watched me or they watched Channel 6 out of Thomasville, Tallahassee, and we were the dominant station. So it wasn't like I was competing with CNN or ESPN or all mm -hmm. these others, and that made a big difference in that race, too. Mm -hmm. They just, they, they were exposed to me whether they wanted to be or not. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, first, uh, uh, job you had was to talk about committees. Uh, how did you go about uh, selecting committees and which committees were you appointed to? Well, <clears throat> my predecessor had served on the uh, Agriculture Committee and, and I had made a commitment that that's the committee I would try to get assigned to. And of course, it, um, it, in those days, the committee, the Democratic Committee on Committees was the Democratic members of the Ways and Means Committee. And Phil Landrum uh, was on the Ways and Means Committee, and he was my advocate to, 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 to get on the Agriculture Committee, and he was successful in doing that. I think there were six or seven of us freshmen who went on the committee that year, and Phil got me on ahead of everybody else, which gave me a, a leg up on seniority. Even though I was the youngest guy I had the, the lead on seniority, which proved to be valuable in terms of subcommittee chairmanships opening up. I was next in line. Phil Landrum, by the way, uh, he was he was wonderful to me. He took me under his wing, and he, he he led me, and he guided me, and he kept me out of trouble on a lot of things. He and he and I did a, an interesting deal in '70. I guess it must have been in '72. Nixon. Uh, had a proposal to reduce the uh, the uh, tax on automobiles, new automobiles being sold. I forget what the, his package was, but he would take the, the luxury tax off of automobiles and sent that proposal to the Ways and Means Committee. Well, I discovered that what he had done was pertaining only to automobiles. It didn't pertain to pickup trucks. Well, behold, I've got a few pickup trucks in my district. So I went to Mr. Landrum, and, <laughs> and his eyes lit up. He said, I think we got us a good issue. So he, we dropped the bill in together, and eventually when the bill passed, it had the exemption for pickup trucks as well. Phil Landrum was a giant of a man. Uh, were there other committees uh, besides agriculture? No, I, I didn't even try for another committee the first year. They, they came, Phil came to me. At the beginning of, uh, I guess it would have been '73, the beginning of my second term, and said they they need we need you on the House Administration Committee, and that's the committee that uh, does housekeeping. It's, it's it's runs the restaurants. It's responsible for parking. It's responsible for uh, office staff allowances. But it's it's just it's a members committee more or less and no glamour just a lot of work but it also is good for a, 
uh, you can develop a little power base off of, of that committee by doing favors for other members. So I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, kind of thing. So I said, well, sure, I'll be glad to to serve if, if leadership wants me to be there. And they also were looking for somebody that they thought had some stay in power. You don't want to put somebody on that as uh, going to be up for re-election that, that might get beat because he voted to increase staff uh, the money to, for hiring staff by two slots next year. So they thought I was pretty safe, and and I guess I was. And so I, I went on the House Administration Committee at the beginning of my second term. And he, it was chaired by a crusty old fellow from Ohio by the name of Wayne Hayes, who, <laughs> who later found himself in some hot water about a, a young lady by the name of Elizabeth Ray, and her, Wayne ended up resigning uh, from, from Congress as a result of that scandal. But I enjoyed that service on the, on the uh, House Administration Committee. One of the subcommittees I served on there was the Elections Subcommittee, and following the Watergate situation with uh, with Nixon, we passed some new election laws, including the, the 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 public funding for presidential elections, uh, as and some other election reforms, which we placed, tried to place some limitations on contributions, limitations on spending, and Supreme Court knocked down so, several of those. We had to go back and redo it in 76, but that was interesting work. When they started talking about the uh, funding, public funding for presidential elections, I offered an amendment in, in, um, in committee that said prior to the time that any candidate could receive federal funds for uh, to, to spend on his election, and he'd have to take an IQ test. And he didn't have to pass it, but the results had to be made public. And I've often thought in recent days with George W. Bush in the White House uh, how the future of this country might have been changed if my amendment had passed. <laughs> you later served on the Steering and Policy Committee. Yeah, as a result of... Uh, <clears throat> As a result of Watergate, um, we elected a huge class of Democrats in 1974 that came in, in 1975, and they were reform-minded, to, to, to say the least. They, don't, they knocked off uh, three committee chairmen, long-serving committee chairmen, Democratic committee chairmen, because until that time it had been just a seniority system. Uh, that dictated who was going to be the chairman of the committee, nothing, nothing but seniority. And this new class, decided, well, along with some reform-minded Democrats who had already been there, decided they wanted to change that. So they took away the ability of the Ways and Means Committee Democrats to be the steering and policy committee, and they established a new form of selection. And basically it was that there would be 13 zones around the country, uh, that would have one member elected by the Democratic members within that zone, and then the speaker and the leadership would have the other 13, speaker having a seat, the majority leader having a seat, the whip having a seat, chief deputy whip, caucus chair, blah, blah, blah. So I got myself uh, elected from the zone that represented Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and, and, and Tennessee, so I had the pleasure of serving on the Steering and Policy Committee for, for four years, which at that time was, well, I, my, my term had expired, but you could only be there uh, for four years anyway. But that, the Steering and Policy Committee is a very interesting committee because it, it makes committee assignments for incoming members or members that want to move from one committee to the other. So uh, that also gives you a little, a little clout. A little clout. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have used that word, Bob, but I wouldn't disagree. Ed Jenkins uh, told me that uh, you're responsible for him getting on the Ways and Means Committee uh, as a freshman. Well, Ed probably gives me a little too much credit, but I think I might have had something to do with it. <laughs> that little knocker would not give me any alternative. I had uh, <clears throat> a handful of freshmen coming in that year, including three from Georgia. Not only Ed, but uh, Billy Lee Evans from Macon and Doug Bernard from uh, from Augusta. And 
<clears throat> Evans wanted public works, I can do that. Uh, Bernard wanted banking, I can do that. Jenkins wants Ways and Means. Well, there hasn't been a freshman to go on Ways and Means Committee in 50 years. A freshman Democrat may have been a Republican or two, I don't know. But I kept telling Jenkins, I said, Jenkins, you know, I got to have some backup. Give me some way out. He said, I can't, I don't want anything else. I said, well, Jenkins, you, if we don't get Ways and Means, which is one of the last committees that's assigned, you may end up on the D.C. committee. Now, Jenkins said, well, I'll be the best member of the D.C. <laughs> committee ever had. So, <laughs> so he held out, and we were able to... Uh, we were able to prevail, but I got to tell you, Bob Maul, seriousness, and Jenkins knows this, he's never admitted it to me, but his predecessor, Bill Landrum, had something to do with that too, because he had a lot of friends that he left in Congress. And he, Ed had, had, had worked for Phil, had served Phil for a number of years, and I know Phil called on his friends to, to help Ed. But we also had uh, another Georgia, we, got, we put Watch Fowler on the Ways and Means Committee. And actually, I had four, I put four, well, I nominated and was able to help get four members from my zone on that committee in one year. And I must say that's, it's, it's a little unusual to be able to do that. I had Harold Ford from Tennessee and Kenny Holland from South Carolina, Ed Jenkins from Georgia, and Watch Fowler later in the, in the year from Georgia. Isn't it unusual to have two members from one state? Depends on the size of the state, but yes, it is. But particularly a st state size of Georgia. I mean, at that time, I think we had eight Democratic members. But but it's uh, a little little unusual. Let's get back to you. Uh, there's an expression around Washington, which I've heard many times, is that freshmen should be seen and not heard. Uh, do you remember your uh, first floor speech? I don't. Do you? <laughs> do you? Do you remember your first vote? <clears throat> I, I couldn't tell you that. No, I couldn't. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just, I, I, I know that whatever, whatever, whatever I was talking about, I must have been nervous as a cat, but I don't remember it today. I couldn't tell you that. Could it be the for speaker in the caucus? Well, that would have been in the. Well, yeah, it would have been even in 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 the. Uh, yeah, that would have probably been the first vote. It would have been the first vote would be for, for the speaker. Yeah. And, and that, that would have been for Carl Albert. Carl Albert, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jenkins also told me that he had a mentor uh, who was Phil Landrum. Did you have one? Phil Landrum. Phil Landrum. Yeah, Phil Landrum <clears throat> was extremely kind and generous to me. He kind of took me under his wing, as they say, and he introduced me to a lot of people, and, and he helped me a lot. He, The chairman of the Ways and Means Committee at that time was Wilbur Mills from Arkansas, and Phil and Wilbur Mills were very close. And <clears throat> this is prior to the time that it was known that Wilbur had an alcohol problem. You know, he ended up in, uh, <laughs> with, with a young woman who was <clears throat> somewhat notorious as a dancer called Fanny Fox and jumped in the title basin one night after she got out of Mr. Mills' car, but Wilbur had a little hideaway right off the floor of the house, a 208, a H-208, <clears throat> and about bull bat time every day, a lot of the older members, including Phil, would go have a pop with Mr. Mills in that little hideaway there, and, and they started inviting me to come by there and, and uh, and socialized with him, and I, I was, you know, I was taken aback at first, but then it was, a, I realized what a high honor it was to be accepted by the old bulls. And, and parenthetically, I never saw Wilbur Mills take a drink. Uh, I had, no, I was, I couldn't have been more shocked when all this came out about him. But he certainly, Wilbur Mills was certainly one of the most knowledgeable and intelligent men I've ever ever known in my life. He. He was the tax code, um, and, and he ran that committee with an iron hand, but Phil Landrum had a great deal of sway with Wilbur, and they were very, very close friends, and when, when they invited me into that uh, inner circle, I felt like I had, I had arrived, as it, as it were, but they were very good to me, particularly Phil Landrum. 
What was the interrelationship between the Georgia delegation? Well, by and large, it was good, well, particularly among Democrats. Um, but I, <clears throat> I guess, Stuckey was the was the the newest member of the delegation until I got there. He went there in '66 and uh, were elected in '66, born in '67, and I came in '70. But other than that, I mean, they some of those guys been around for a while. Phil, Phil I think Phil Lander went up there in '54. And Jack Flint went up there very shortly after that, and uh, you know John Davis and and Bob Stevens and and uh, some of those guys have been around for a long time. So I was kind of the new kid on the block, but they I, we had a good working relationship within that delegation. Uh, Brinkley was was Jack Brinkley was there. Uh, I, I would say it was extreme. We tried to help each other, and we kind of, you know, spread out over the various committees. I had agriculture, Phil had ways and means, Jack Flynn had appropriations, Bob Stevens had banking, and if we needed something from those, one of us needed something from one of those areas, everybody worked well, very well together, I would say. Okay. During your time in Congress, uh, there were several issues that actually divided the American people. Now let's talk about some of them, like the Vietnam War. Well, you're right. It was very divisive, and and uh, even more so, far more so than the situation in Iraq is today. But it was it was a very trying time because it was uh, every every night, even when I was at television station, it was so many casualties in, in Vietnam today, but they also did the body counts of the other side, you know. We lost 24 soldiers today, but we killed 216 Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, and you never knew how accurate any of that was. But it was it was bloody, it was, people were very divided over it. But the, the attitude of most people in my congressional district was, if you're not gonna win it, get out. And of course, there was no win it. In my judgment, even looking back at it now from the perspective of 35 years having gone by, you, there was no way to win it. There's no win. You, you're fighting, uh, you don't know who you're fighting. You, 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 you see them in the street right to, to today and tonight they're shooting at you. I mean, how do you know who they are? And I'm afraid we got ourselves bogged down in that kind of situation in Iraq. I hope I'm wrong. and, and uh, of course, the, 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 the casualties, the number of fatalities in Iraq is not nearly approximated that of what we had in Vietnam, but I think that uh, the, the total, the dollar cost and the cost and, and the prestige and the damage that's been done to the reputation of our country will exceed what happened in Vietnam over a long period of time, but that's not what you asked me about. People were divided, and, and uh, my stance was not any different than that of a majority of the people in my district, and that is, let's win it or get out. But I continued to vote to support the appropriations for that war. I didn't feel like we could abandon the troops, and I voted right up to the last to, to, to fund it. But the big push was to cut off funding for the war, and, and the theory being if you didn't have the money, then obviously you have to bring the troops out. But I'm convinced that we could have gotten out of Vietnam a lot earlier than, than we did. I think that uh, it was prolonged unnecessarily by the actions of the Nixon administration. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, regrettable. One of the great failures of the Nixon administration to not have ended that war earlier. He knew there was no way that, uh, that we were going to win it. I mean, it couldn't be done. Dawson, President Nixon resigned on August the 9th, uh, 1770, uh, 1794. 1794. Yeah, uh, uh, under the, <laughs> under the Bob, I was not there in 1794. <laughs> under the threat of impeachment. I may have been there in 1974. Uh, do you think the, uh, <clears throat> the House of Representatives would have voted impeachment? I don't think there's any doubt about it. Yeah, they would have. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little story that you probably want to edit out when you 
make the cut on this, but when they had the the, the famous 18-minute gap on the tapes came out, they had, up until that time, the Nixon administration had made the conscious decision politically that they were going to stonewall it. But after that disclosure, they decided they were going to let it all hang out. They were going to tell it all. So he invited a group of uh, mainly Southern Democrats who had been largely supportive of him on Vietnam and a lot of other domestic issues to come down to the White House and have dinner, and he was going to have a, 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 a tell it all, answer any question you've got kind of session with us that had generally been supportive of him. So the after dinner, the question and answer session began, and the first question that was asked was by a crusty old Floridian by the name of Bob Sykes, who happened to be a native of Worth County, Georgia, but Bob lived in Crestview, Florida and represented the Panhandle area for many years, and he was a senior member of the Appropriations Committee. And it just happened that over that previous weekend, there had been some threats by Russia to go into Israel because Israel and Egypt were in a little uh, a tiff. Well, Nixon had put our armed forces on alert to be prepared to go in in case Russia went after Israel. And I, you probably would remember that, and not many people that will be watching this would remember that, but it happened. And Sykes asked the question, well, do you think that you putting the, the troops on alert caused the Russians to back away from their threat? Well, Nixon went into a 15-minute dialogue on the history of the Middle East, and it was obvious that he was very well uh, informed. He, he, he knew the issues. And then at the end of that time, he said, but let me tell you one thing. He said, uh, Mr. Khrushchev has his finger on a button that can kill 50 million Americans, and I know it. And I have my finger on a button that can kill 150 million Russians, and he knows that. And in his exact words, he goddamn well don't want to F with me. I walked out of the White House that night. Stucky was with me. We, I think we'd ridden down there together. We were still on speaking terms in those days. But we walked out of the White House that night. We both were shaking. I mean, this, this man had just lost it. And I would have voted to impeach him if for no other reason than I thought he was insane. Uh, and I think that... Uh, uh, in many ways, he had a good presidency, and, and he did many things I agree with. But at the end, uh, and understandably, I mean, the pressure he was under had to drive anybody nuts. But uh, but I think he was just over the over the edge. I never saw him, Bob, and it, I don't want to sound like I'm dumping on him because I say I agree with a lot of what he did. But I never saw him when he didn't have makeup on. Uh, we'd go down to the to the White House for any function. And he had this pancake, you know, he had that dark mm -hmm. beard yeah. that probably cost him the election against Kennedy, and and, uh, and he was very conscious of it. But by the time you'd get to the White House at 7 o'clock at night or so for a reception or dinner, it would, it would be down on his collar. Mm -hmm. and only man I ever saw that wore makeup consistently. Yeah. The question at the time was, what did he know and when did he know about Watergate? Do you have any theory on that? No, I, I think that's been pretty well documented that he he knew it. Uh, I don't think he knew it beforehand, but I think he knew it pretty shortly after that it, it happened and and uh, and and did do his best to, to cover it up. If he had come clean or if he had taken those tapes out on the South Lawn of the White House, called the press in and said, watch me pour gasoline on these and burn them, it would have never happened. But, it, but he was concerned, as I, every president must be, about his place in history and how he'll be judged. And I think he, I think he thought it could snowball, which is a mistake most politicians who find themselves in trouble make. They, they, they try to cover it up, they try to deny it, and by and large, the American people are pretty forgiving. And if you come out and say, I made a mistake, you know, we believe in redemption. And if you say, I made a mistake and I'm going to do better, uh, they, they might let you get away with it, but if they catch you lying uh, in a bald-faced lie, 
they don't respond to that very well. But the remarkable thing about the Nixon situation was the night that he left, uh, or the day he left, that, that, that Jerry Ford took over, uh, there were no tanks in the streets. Uh, you know, there, there was no armed rebellion. It was, it was very peaceful and, and very tranquil, and it worked. Our, our system worked. But that was one of the toughest, uh, toughest times in the history of this country, and I, I will always treasure the fact that I was there while, while that was going on. I had several friends, good friends, who served on the, on the Judiciary Committee with Chairman Peter Rodino, and Rodino was a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. But Walter Flowers from Alabama, and, and uh, Larry Hogan, from a Republican from Maryland, and these guys were close to me, and I know what they were going through. Walter Flowers uh, from Alabama <coughs> had, had the Nixon folks, I don't know where Nixon did or not, but the Nixon folks called George Wallace and, and, and got George Wallace to try to put pressure on Walter. And Walter told me that he had gotten a call from Governor Wallace about uh, his vote, but uh, Walter was at the White House that night, Nixon made the Khrushchev comment too, and I think that rattled him as much as, as all the things that he had done to try to cover up the Watergate. But the most remarkable thing, as I say, was that it was so peaceful. The, the very traumatic time, but the country survived. Mm -hmm. Gerald Ford, he became president. What was the mood of Congress at that time? I would say that most members of Congress wanted to see Jerry Ford succeed. Jerry Ford was a decent, good man. We 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 might have disagreed on some issues, but I, I can tell you, I voted with Ford probably more often than I did with uh, with my leadership on a lot of issues, uh, fiscal issues, uh, those kinds of things. I, I had a good relationship with Ford. Uh, in those days, unlike today in the post Gingrich area era, you could get along across the aisle. You could you could work with each other. You and, and you, we got things done for the country, and Jerry Ford was a large part of that. He, even though he was highly partisan on some issues, he also put the country ahead of his party. And Jerry, Jerry Ford was a decent guy, and I think most members, Democratic and Republican, wanted to see him be successful. Uh, of course, when, it, when, when Jimmy Carter uh, became the, a candidate on the Democratic side, and I, obviously my support went to Carter, I didn't support forward for president, but I wanted him to be successful. I want every American president to be successful. But, uh, but Jerry deserved better than he got I, in, in retrospect. And as far as the reputation he had for, <laughs> for clumsiness and, you know, the, the Chevy Chase character off Saturday Night Live, that wasn't Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford was a good athlete. He wasn't a brilliant man. I certainly wouldn't say that he had the uh, the IQ of an Ed Jenkins or Elliot Levitas, but uh, but Jerry was no nobody's dummy either. Oh. A good good man, good guy. You think that Watergate was the reason for his defeat? Well, I'm not sure of Watergate per se. Watergate had a lot to do with it. There's no doubt about that. But I think the fact that that uh, he pardoned Nixon probably as a result of Watergate probably had more to do with his defeat than anything else. Plus. Carter was a charming candidate. He was a very attractive uh, candidate, a fresh face, an alternative to business as usual in Washington, and and uh, you know that million dollar smile, and and I will never lie to you. Uh, it, it all those things contributed, but I think probably pardoned Nixon probably cost Ford more than anything else. You recall the Ab scam scandal. <laughs> Shoot, I reckon. <laughs> what What are your memories of that? Bob, I, my belief always has been that it was pure and simple entrapment. Um, now, you can argue that that didn't justify what happened with these members of Congress, but, uh, you know, Eve couldn't resist the, the fruit. and. Uh, they they went after these guys big time, and, and, it, and there's no doubt in my mind either that <clears throat> they went after the Democrats because I'm speaking even now though, the FBI. 
even the FBI. You see, they, they got six Democrats, and I think one day somebody down there in the FBI woke up and said, whoa, wait a minute, we got to go get us a Republican. And that's when they went after Dick Kelly from Florida, and he was the seventh abscam victim. And when they got him, they shut the operation down. Now, what does that tell you? Uh, I regret it. There's no justification for it. Um, I, at that time, the time that abscam was going on, had been through a divorce. Financially, I was strapped. I got four kids, uh, two of whom are approaching college age. And despite the fact that you're making $42,500 a year, which was a raise from the $1,000 a month I was making at the television station, when you have a house in D.C. and a house in Georgia and you back and forth, it, the money doesn't go very far. But Long story short, I was strapped. And I don't know what I would have done if they had walked in there and offered me $50,000 to do what I had already done for nothing for people. I think I know what I would have done. But I don't want to face that temptation. Um, what, what these guys were asked to do was to introduce a bill to prohibit Bob Short from being expelled from the country. He had been here on a visa and he wanted to stay and if you introduced a bill to say you can't expel him, that bill would be referred to the Judiciary Committee. And until the Judiciary Committee acted on that bill, Bob Short couldn't be expelled. So, I mean, that's, it's a, I had nurses who were here from the Philippines who had overstayed their uh, visa but they needed, the hospital where they were working needed them. So the way you keep them here is introduce a bill. And, and it, it, you know, you do it for nothing. If somebody comes in and says, you know, something you do for nothing, I'll give you $50,000 to do, uh, it, 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 could be a, it could be a pretty big temptation. I'm glad I wasn't exposed to it. You mentioned having a home in Georgia and having a home in Washington. How did you balance your duties as a congressman and your need to campaign in the district? Well, I, I guess that came pretty easily to me. By, I told you I moved my family up there in, in December of 1970, but they didn't like it. My wife didn't like it, and the children weren't happy, and so we decided that uh, we, we, we'd move back to the district. I, when I was there, it was like I was coming home almost every weekend to campaign or to, to, to do events or whatever the reason might be. And so we moved uh, back to Albany in 72. And that way I did see more of them actually than I did while I was in D.C., but still I didn't see nearly enough of them. That's what politics does to you, particularly when you have a young, when you have a young family as I did. Um, in retrospect, uh, I, you can't change anything, and there's not a lot I would change. But I probably, uh, I probably got into it too early. My kids should have been older because I, I missed a lot of things with them that I regret. Um, I just guess I wasn't the kind of father I needed to be. I've tried to make it up to them since. I don't think you ever really can, but. I'm closer to all my children now than I ever was when they were small, and I feel like that I missed a great part of their lives. But when you're when you are, when you're in politics, that happens. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it takes a toll on the family. Mm -hmm. Just before you left office in uh, in '80, uh, Carter was president, and we had the uh, Iranian hostage problem. Uh, do you think that this country could have done more to, to have them freed while Carter was president? I don't know what it could have possibly been, Bob. I mean, I, I really don't. Uh, 
the, the, the only way I guess you have a chance of getting them out of there outside of diplomatic channels is to do what they tried to do. And uh, Carter didn't screw that up. Uh, he, he took the blame for it, as he should. He was a, he's the commander-in-chief. He was president, but that was a military snafu. Uh, when they re had the, the d disaster out there in the desert, but I don't know what possibly could have been done more to, uh, to get them out of there than what was. And there's no doubt in my mind that the, the Reagan people cut a deal with the Iranians to, to have them released if he were elected. Uh, I mean, it's got to be more than co coincidence that they were released uh, the day he was sworn into office. Hmm. And of course, we know later on what happened with his arms for hostages the deal, which is just, to me, uh, one of the darkest episodes in American history. But, uh, but most of the people down in our part of the country think that Reagan was probably one of the finest presidents we've ever had. I, I have uh, <laughs> a little differing opinion on that. Mm -hmm. I think some ways he did do a good job, other ways he nearly bankrupted the country. Carter became president and uh, he was uh, accused of not having good relations with Congress and not having a good effort to get along with Congress. Is that true? Well, I don't think he did all he could to, to get along with Congress. It was kind of like when he was uh, governor of Georgia. I think that uh, when the legislature didn't do what he wanted to, he kind of went uh, directly to the people, and that's just not going to work in a congressional setting. And uh, he, he also was a, a little, maybe not him, personally, but his staff was a little reluctant to, to, to let his friends help him in Congress. And there's no, there's no doubt that there was some antagonism uh, between him and Congress. He, he, and, he and Tip O'Neill, Speaker O'Neill, never had the kind of relationship that O'Neill later de developed with Reagan. I think that uh, Tip and, and Ronald Reagan got along a lot better than Tip and, and Jimmy Carter did. Uh, <laughs> Tip had a particular dislike for Hamilton Jordan. He, he called him Hannibal Jerkin. Uh, <laughs> and, and he, he uh, Hamilton kind of, they had the, the attitude, well, we want it and it's ours and, and we're going to run this thing. And, you, you know, you, you just got to, you got to have some help. You've got to, you can't dictate to the Congress what they're going to do because, uh, particularly on the House side, they, you know, the only way you get to become a member of the House of Representatives is to be elected by the people. You can be appointed to the Senate, you can be appointed Vice President and become the President as Jerry Ford did, but if you're a member of the House, you've been elected by the people. And uh, I love the institution, I always will, and I got a great deal of respect for it, but we can be pretty independent cussers because we ain't got the answer to Jimmy Carter. We answer to the people in our districts. And I, I think the president's got to realize that if he's going to be successful, he's got to learn to deal with, with the, with the particular members of the House. I think sometimes the Senate is easier to deal with for a president than the, than the House is. Another rap on Carter was that his staff was too inexperienced and too Georgian. I won't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a great deal of. of uh, the truth that Billy Evans told me one time when <clears throat> Billy was was a member of Congress, Central Georgia Macon, he, he said, Mathis, you ever have trouble getting to the president? I said, yeah, I, I do. He said, well, I, I figured out, uh, no, do you ever have trouble getting to Herm Hamilton Jordan? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, I figured out how to get to Hamilton Jordan. I said, well, how's that, Billy? He said, well, I called the White House and say I need to speak to the president. He said, Hamilton will call me back. If I call Hamilton, he'll never call me back, but he wants to know what I want to talk to the president about. So I started doing that, and doggone if Billy Evans wasn't right. So that, but Hamilton, uh, may he rest in peace. I liked Hamilton, and he was, he was a good guy uh, and went through a lot of travails in his final years. But, but I think that, uh, that, that there was an arrogance there that, we won it, we earned it, it's ours, and uh, yeah, I think, I think it may have been. He, he needed more, a, a broader base of experience than what he brought 
with the crowd that he brought to Washington. But there were some very, very competent, capable people. Bert Lance, uh, you know, a very, very talented man. Jody Powell is still in D.C. and has done very well for himself in, in, in private practice. Um, there, were, there were a lot of good people, but I think overall they, they needed more diversity and a wider, uh, a wider background of experiences than what they brought to the White House. In a situation where you run for president as an outsider, usually when you arrive in Washington, you are an outsider. That's correct. How do you work your way inside? Well, I think you have to do it very, very carefully. You have to, you have to show first of all that you're willing to work uh, with the with the Congress, and. And I think that's integral to it, to, to be open to them. You, you, as I said earlier, you can't dictate to Congress what they're going to do. You have to reach out and, and say, you know, how can we accomplish this? How can we working together get this done? Um, and I think that's the only way it happens. You, you cannot run roughshod over the Congress. And, and I think that uh, some, some people have learned that the hard way. Reagan was an outsider, but he, he worked well with the Congress, including with the Democrats. He never could have accomplished what he did legislatively without some Democratic support. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, he and Tip O'Neill had a great personal relationship. They might fight like cats and dogs about some issue, but at the end of the day, Tip would go down to the White House and they'd have a drink. And that's the way I'd like to see it be today. Unfortunately, it's gotten to be so uh, so much of a cat fight on both sides of the aisle that they just don't seem like they can come together to do anything that's good for the country. And I regret that. 1980, you decided to run for the United States Senate. What prompted that decision? Well, I thought I could win. <laughs> that ought to be fairly obvious, Bob. No, it was, <clears throat> it was very clear that Senator Talmadge was in some trouble. Uh, I, I saw polls. In fact, I had polling done that said he was not going to be reelected, and 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 th those polls were correct, and I was correct. What I didn't foresee was that there'd be so many peop other people in the race, including Zell Miller and Norman Underwood. Uh, I thought, and I still think, if I could have gotten him one on one, that I could have, I could have won. I knew Zell couldn't. Zell, at that time, was perceived, if you can believe it, based on his. Uh, actions in the past few years, he at that time was perceived as being too liberal for Georgia. And once he got into runoff with Senator Talmadge, Senator Talmadge just kind of annihilated him. But uh, I, I thought that, uh, that, the, that the time was ripe. Senator Talmadge had had the, prob the ethical problems, um, um, and then he'd had the, the alcohol-related problems, and I thought he'd been weakened to the point where uh, I could take him on. And as it turned out, you know, I was correct that he wasn't going to be reelected. I just didn't foresee that it would be a Republican that would do it. The re Republicans were just beginning to come into to prominence in Georgia in those days. But uh, Mac Mattingly, who was a nice guy, was probably about as weak a candidate as you'll ever see, uh, <clears throat> and certainly was about as weak a senator as you're ever going to see get elected to the Senate. Uh, but it, it, and several people, not several, well, many people talked to me about switching parties and running as a Republican, and probably if I had done that and were able to secure the nomination, I might have won that seat, but I wasn't going to walk away from uh, the Democratic Party. Not that I had, well, it, I just, it, it, to me, it wouldn't be right. You dance with a girl, what brung you? Um, unlike Zell Miller, who I think is a real turncoat and has betrayed many of his friends and loyal supporters who helped him over the years and he just turned his back on them and thumbed his nose at them in these last few elections and I've lost all respect I might ever had for him. Well getting back to that campaign uh, in 1980, uh, uh, financially were you in good shape? Were you oh. ready to run? <laughs> no. No, we were not, and I guess all told during that period of time, 
during that entire race, we probably raised about a quarter of a million dollars. I was severely underfunded, and I knew uh, <clears throat> weeks ahead of the election that I was not going to win. Um, we, we couldn't raise the money. Uh, and I guess probably the, 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 the hardest period of my life was getting up every morning and going out to those factory gates at 5 o'clock in the morning and shaking those hands when you knew you were not going to win and uh, trying to keep your staff going and keep them buoyed and uh, keep their spirits up and it's uh, it was a it was a tough time but you know we had no had no choice but to go forward with it uh, I, I i must say that i'd gotten a little bored in the house it, 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 you know you sit through the same peanut here and uh year after year after year you hear the same witnesses talk about the same problems it uh, it gets a little boring. I enjoyed my service in the house, but it, the time had come for me to to move on, either either to go to the Senate, which I think I would have been fairly good as a member. Um, in fact, I, I know I would, and I know I would have enjoyed it, and I know I could have done good things for this state. But I've often said that the uh, that, that, that making that decision to run for the Senate in 1980 was the best mistake I ever made. Uh, if I couldn't go to the Senate, it was time for me to get out and try to make enough money to educate my children and and move on to the next phase of my life. So I have no regrets about having done it, um, even though it, 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 was a, it was a mistake. And I've had people, many people in my district tell me I could have held that seat as long as I wanted it. And I think there may be some merit uh, to that. A Democrat still holds the majority part of that uh, part of that district, Sanford Bishop, uh, <clears throat> but but it was it was time it was time for me to to do something else. Yeah, even in politics, you must follow your heart. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Let's talk for a minute about party politics in Georgia, since you mentioned that. Uh, Nineteen sixty four. President Johnson told our Senator Dick Russell when he signed the Civil Rights Bill that he had turned the South over to the Republicans. That eventually happened, but in Georgia it took 40 years. Now how do you account for all the other southern states becoming Republican while Georgia held on to the Democrats for that 40 years? Well, I'm not sure it took 40 years, Bob. It, it, it began to happen in the 70s. Um, as my service on the Steering and Policy Committee <clears throat> with Mendel Davis from South Carolina, Walter Flowers from Alabama, some fairly conservative, at least middle of the road Democrats from our part of the country, we told the Steering and Policy Committee time after time where we are going to lose our seats in the House is going to be in the South, and you could see it happening. And, and it wasn't happening that fast in Georgia. Bo Calloway was the first Republican elected to Congress from Georgia, and he was elected in 1964. Uh, but it was happening in other states, and, and I think we clearly foresaw it was happening here. If you keep making the Democrats take the gas, as it were. But there's no doubt in my mind that in, uh, that in 1968, Lee Atwater, who was Nixon's primary strategist, made a, forced Nixon into making a conscious decision to go after the white Southern vote and ignore the Northern black vote. It probably happened even earlier than that. In 1960, there were signs of that. If you remember correctly, Jack Kennedy called Martin Luther King's wife while he was in jail down here uh, to, to, to say that they were going to do everything they could to try to get him out, and I think that probably turned the election. Now, in spite of that, Jack Kennedy carried Georgia by the second largest margin of any state in the country. But the, but the, the Republicans for years saw that the white vote was up for grab in the South. And they did everything they could to go after that vote. And, and they've done that consistently since 1968. Uh, it's the, the way they win elections is not on issues anymore. I mean, you talk about 
issues like war and peace or the economy and it's race and religion it's smear and fear it's gays and guns um, and and that's unfortunately that's what it's become and and that as I said earlier today <clears throat> when when I was in Congress and Jenkins and Evans and these guys were in Congress you could work with your counterparts across the aisle. It didn't matter that they were Republicans or you were Democrats. Let's get something done for the good of the country. But since then, it's like, you know, they're at each other's throat. They, they run on these issues, and I think Newt Gingrich is more responsible for this than anybody in, in the country when he started going after Jim Wright with all these uh, half-factual things that destroyed Wright's career. But they pick out your opponent's weak points and go after him, attack him personally. And that's what it's become, unfortunately. And I think we need to get back to, to the day where men and women of goodwill can sit down across a table no matter what their political backgrounds and try to do what's right for the country. And unfortunately, we're a long way from there today. And it's regrettable. Here in Georgia, how do you see the future of the Democratic Party over the years? I think that uh, <clears throat> I think that it'll it'll swing more back Democratic as as uh, the minority uh, population continues to grow, uh, and even I think some some people will come to realize who now are more inclined to be Republican that they really uh, have been duped over the years by what these Republicans are telling them. They're going to do something about abortion. They're, you know, the, when, when I go into the, uh, the polling place, I'm not going in there to call a preacher. I'm going in there to vote for who I think will do the best for the country. And, and sooner or later, a lot of these folks are going to realize they've been fooled. The Republicans are going to look after the pharmaceuticals and the big bankers and the big oil and the insurance companies, and they do that at the expense of the working folks. And and working folks are told, well, we, you know, we're not for gays. They're the, the the Democrats are against guns. You know, they they get all these wage issues that they never do anything about, and they can't do anything about them because of court decisions. But uh, people continue to to buy into it. You know, I, I drive by some some pretty uh, dilapidated mobile homes down here a lot of times see a junk peep sitting in the front yard with a Bush 04 bumper sticker on the back of it. And what in the world are these people thinking? I mean, I, I don't know. But I, I think that's going to change over time. The, clearly, the minority population of Georgia is, is, uh, is growing. And I, I think that they're going to uh, tend to vote uh, more democratic, and the, 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 the Georgia delegation now is b b closer back to a balance between Republicans and Democrats than it was. It was almost all democratic for years and years and years, and then it was heavily democratic, and then it was heavily Republican, and now it swung back to a degree. You hear a lot of complaints, at least I do, from old-time Democrats that uh, that our state party is uh, is, is too dependent upon minorities and labor unions for support, and they aren't happy with that. Uh, is there a balance? Has to be a balance, Bob, and I think there's some legitimacy to that perception. I'm not true that it, I mean, I'm not convinced that it's actually true that the party is dominated by minorities and labor unions and uh, liberal academics or whatever it may be, but I think that's the perception that's out there. And uh, of course, as, you know, it's gotten to be, at least in, in South Georgia, I don't know where it, how it is in the mountains up there where you are, but it's socially uh, correct to be Republican. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the, you know, if you're going to belong to the, to the Kiwanis Club or the, or the Country Club or the Rotary Club, you, you know, you're just Republican. It's, and at one time it was that way with the Democrats, but, but that's all been changed by these other things that we were talking about. But uh, I, there, there is certainly some truth to the perception that the party is dominated by minorities and, and labor. But, and 
I don't know how I don't know how you fix that over a period of time. I just don't know. Well, up in the mountains where I came from, you, you've already hit the nail on the head. It's uh, it's God gaze and uh, guns and that's yeah. and and NASCAR. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's how yeah. they vote, and uh, you can have counties with my home county up there now, for example. Every office holder is Democratic. But they have voted, the people have voted Republican in state elections and in national elections for years. And it's that, and which brings up a question I want to ask you. Crossover voting. We do not require party registration in Georgia. Is that good or is that bad? I think it's good. Uh, but, there, but there's legitimate arguments on both sides of it. Um, but I, I would prefer that it stay the way that it is, that you can vote, you know, either Republican or in the Democratic or Republican primary. For example, back in the presidential preference primary in February, I voted in the Democratic primary. My wife chose to vote in the Republican primary. And I, I think that choice is, is good. But there are a lot of people who won't vote in those primaries because they don't want to have to make a choice where they're going to vote. I'm not going to tell them where I'm going to vote Democratic or Republican. I've heard that more than once. When we had our first really contested statewide Republican primary in Georgia, and I believe it was in 78, I, my office was just flooded with calls from people saying, I went into the polls and they asked me if I, wanted, if I was going to vote Democrat or Republican, and I'm not going to tell them how I'm going to vote. So that's been a little uh, people have been a little slow to, to come to be educated about that. How about public financing of a political campaign? Only if they take an IQ test. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, seriously, Bob, I, <clears throat> when I served on the House Administration Committee, we talked about those days when I served on the Elections Committee. I oppose public financing. I, I ended up supporting it in the presidential uh, presidential election. But I have come to believe since those days that that is the answer. The public financing is the answer. Now you have to have some sort of threshold to, to, to have a candidate qualified to receive public funds. Now what that threshold is, I can't tell you. Maybe you've got to collect individual contributions of a minimum of $100 from 500 people, but you set some sort of threshold, and then you take the, the private money out of it. You allocate a certain amount of money for every registered voter in whatever congressional district the guy is running in. Um, and, and, you know, the argument against that is we're spending taxpayer money to have somebody be elected to office. Well, the other side of it is, friends, we're paying for it today because the people that are financing these elections, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, certainly are expecting a return on their investment. And you look at what, what's the way this country is being run and the, and the kind of deficit that we've piled up, uh, we'd be far better off if we had people who were serving in public office who did not owe debts to labor unions or big business or whoever if they only owed the taxpayers. Uh, it, yeah, I, I reluctantly have come to the, to the belief that that's the only way we're ever going to get out of, if we ever can get out of the mess we're in, is to go to some form of public financing. 1978. Jimmy Carter made a speech that became known as the Malays speech. Uh, as I look back on that speech and the conditions of this country today in 2008, I see a similarity. I think Carter was right on the money. Uh, people didn't want to hear it. And <clears throat> of course, it gave his critics something else to to pounce on him about that he was putting the country down, but I think Carter was pretty well, pretty well uh, hit the nail on the head with that one, and, and he he was right, and I agree with you, Bob. I see a lot of similarities today. Um, the the malaise is 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 
maybe it's not as pronounced now as it was then, but I think it's it's certainly there. And, and <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, Carter was a, well, as they say, he was a great prophet, but not really a savior. But what can we do, Dawson, from your experience in the Congress and your wisdom today to overcome this feeling among the American people that things aren't right? Well, I don't know that I have. I, certainly, if I had the answer to that question, Bob, I wouldn't be sitting at a <laughs> a uh, 150-year-old log cabin in Nashville, Georgia, but <laughs> I think I think that a lot of it is that, that we've got to have some leadership in the executive and the congressional branch of government that'll get to us back to doing the things we ought to do. We're destroying this country. I mean, we are, and we're giving it away. Uh, this, you've seen, and everybody in the country I has by now, I guess, this T. Boone Pickens ad where we're sending $700 billion a year to foreigners to support our addiction to oil. That money is not coming back. Or if it comes back, it'll be to buy American businesses where they'll take the profit from that back over there. And we're a bunch of idiots for letting it happen. And and there's no relief in sight. And it's 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 just sad to me that that uh, that, that that we've allowed the country to deteriorate to this point. But we've got no leadership. I mean the, the, when this idiot's term of office is over, he will have put this country in debt. He and his father and Ronald Reagan are responsible for more than 80% of the national debt. Now that is inexcusable and the Republican Party holds themselves up to be the party of fiscal responsibility. What a bunch of BS. And what he's done in Iraq is just in inexcusable and unconscionable. How do we get it back? I don't know. I don't know that the answer is Barack Obama, uh, but I know the answer is not four more years of George Bush. But it, it seems to me, Bob Short, that of all the people that are uh, capable of leading this country, we come up with some of the poorest candidates on both, on both sides. I mean, it's just, it's almost embarrassing. I, I think that it's sad, it's, it's, it's what it is, it's pathetic and it's terrible for the country. I think that when you had political party conventions that actually selected the nominees of the party prior to all this primary, the primary stuff where they're out there pandering in the Democrats their party, they're pandering to the far left and in the Republican party they're pandering to the far right. The country was far better off and had better candidates and better presidents when men and women went into that convention and sat out in that so-called smoke-filled room and selected candidates. Uh, I think we were far better off when you had men like Eisenhower and Truman and Roosevelt that were not selected to the primary process. They were selected by party leaders and the country was far better off and better served by that. But today, we I mean, I don't see how you ever get back to that. The McGovern Commission set up the primary process for the, for the Democrats, and uh, how do you ever now go back and say, well, we're going to take away the people's right to choose their own nominee? Uh, I don't know that you can, but we should. We'd be far better off if we had political professionals, governors and mayors and congressmen and senators selecting who they thought the best candidate would be rather than turning it over to the special interests in both parties. Well, since we probably never will go back to that system, do you think that a, a one-day national presidential primary uh, in each state would help solve this prolonged period <coughs> of campaigning that has gone on in recent times where, for example, this one has gone on now for a year and a half. Bob, I, I think most any change would be constructive and would be better than the process we have now. But I actually, and I'm not sure who originally proposed this, it wasn't me, but I actually prefer what, what would be a series of regional primaries, deep south, far west, northeast, mid-America, uh, and rotate it where they come in differing orders every four years. 
say the deep south states would be in 08 first and then followed by the far west followed by you see what i'm saying and just kind of rotated around where nobody had it first every time i think that would be a more preferable system than what we have today uh, you know it was going to the super tuesdays was going to be the answer the solution to the problem and that turned out not to be the case uh, but, but I, maybe the, the one day thing when that judgment would be an improvement, I don't know how a candidate would handle it. I don't know how you could possibly campaign nationwide in a, in a primary, but it'd be a, it'd be a tough go. Mm -hmm. What's been your proudest moment in politics? Ooh, that's a tough question, Bob. <laughs> I never thought about it. Uh, I guess just getting elected probably with, at the time at least was uh, uh, was my proudest moments. I had some legislative victories in the in the Congress and committee and and uh, and on the floor that I was proud of. We we did uh, we did a total reform of the food stamp program in 1977 that I led the fight on, and I was very proud of that as a legislative accomplishment. We passed those election laws and after post Watergate that I took a great deal of pride in. Um, and there were other, under other legislative victories in the, in the farm area. We re rewrote the peanut program and the rice program and brought them into the 20th century and I was proud of that. But I I guess I'd be real hard pressed to point out any single thing as my proudest political moment. Um, just be too hard to pin it down. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. What has been your biggest disappointment? Ooh, politically? Politically. <laughs> um, well, I guess it, it, the biggest disappointment was not being successful in that Senate race, even though I knew it was going to happen, because I I honestly felt that that uh, that I'd be a good senator. I'd proven my uh, ability to legislate in the House, and and I I was with all uh, all the modesty I can muster. I will say for myself that I I was a good legislator. I did a I built coalitions. I I put together people on both sides of the aisle on various issues and. And there were some that would tell you that at any given time that I probably had from 40 to 50 votes I could deliver on any given issue. And that put me in a, in a position of, of some influence in the House, and I enjoyed that. And it was, it was recognized by some. There were some newspaper stories in Atlanta papers in the late 70s that talked about my, uh, <laughs> some of them called me a riverboat gambler and a and a cowboy and a rogue, but they acknowledge that uh, that we were able to build these coalitions and deliver these votes. And so I, I, I regret that I wasn't able to, to take that ability and that energy to the Senate on behalf of the people of Georgia. But there again, I, mean, I, I can't look back on it. And I, if I had to do it again, I'd, I'd do the same thing. I, I would, uh, I'd make the try. You got to grasp for the ring, even if. Uh, if it, if it eludes you. One question I failed to ask that I would like to ask is practice of earmarks. There's been a lot of uh, criticism recently uh, about earmarks. Uh, what's your opinion of that? I've, I'm of two minds, Bob. I, <clears throat> I think some of them have just been totally, ridiculously outrageous. Like my good friend Don Young from Alaska tried to build that bridge from Ketchikan over to that island for $214 million. I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts. The other side of it is, if you got a railroad crossing in Valdosta, Georgia that ties up traffic trying to get to the hospital uh, by an ambulance carrying a patient out there that's about to die and your train gets stuck there, and you can solve that problem by earmarking a little money in the public works bill that would appropriate a million and a half dollars to find a way to get a bridge over that railroad serving that hospital. That's a different thing. And I 
have always believed that I, as a member of Congress, knew more about what was best for my district than some bureaucrat sitting in the, uh, some office and rabbit warren of an office in Washington. So I can, as, as the preacher said, I can preach it round or I can preach it flat. I mean, but there are arguments on both sides of it. Personally, I think it, the practice of it has been outrageous. The necessity for it in some instances is unquestioned. How would you like to be remembered? Uh, uh, well, I'd like to be remembered as a, as a good son, a good husband, a good father, a good friend, a good neighbor. Uh, I failed the test as a good husband on two previous occasions. I hope I'm doing better. Certainly, certainly pray that I am. I'd like for my children to remember me as somebody who uh, loved them very deeply and, and cared about their future. I've done my best to educate them and help them all I can. And I wish that uh, I could call back a lot of those years that I did not spend with them and, and redo that time. Of course, you can't, obviously you can't do that. Uh, but And I'd like to be remembered by the people that I served as somebody who cared about their interest and did their best to uh, to make their life better in some way, whether it was a farmer or a small businessman in South Georgia or whomever. Uh, and I think that I carried that reputation with me when I left Congress. I, I'd like to think that I, I still have people uh, that I haven't seen. There's a lot of people I don't even know. I might be walking down the street in Valdosta or Tifton and somebody will recognize me and say, you helped my Uncle Joe get his VA check. And of course, I don't remember that. In most instances, it was something that my staff was able to do, but I <clears throat> always drilled in my staff that I know that this is a 500th Social Security case you have handled this year, but to you, it's another case. To that widow woman down there in Doran, Georgia, it's her life. So we did a good job staff-wise, and I'd like to be remembered uh, for, for that kind of constituent service. Thank you very much, Congressman Dawson Mathis. Thank you, Bob. I've enjoyed it.